So good morning, my name is Jim Wyckoff. Um, welcome to the Curry School, and uh, thank you for attending the Curry Lectureship Series. As most of you know, this series is sponsored by the Virginia Education Sciences Training Program, or VEST, the pre-doctoral training program here at the Curry School that reaches across grounds, and it's, the money comes from the U.S. Department of Ed, the Institute of Education Sciences. Today I'm really delighted to welcome Professor Doug Harris, Doug is a professor in the Economics Department at Tulane University and the Schneider Foundation Chair in Public Education. Doug has published on topics in education policy ranging from teacher labor markets to financial incentives for college attainment and lots of things in between. His work has been published in journals in education, economics, sociology, public policy, and most of that work has been supported by grants that total now more than $12 million, I think. While Doug's scholarship is impressive, what has always impressed me more is his ability to successfully engage in and influence the policy process. I think that's something that is frustrating to many academics, but Doug has found a way to make it work. He's provided advice to the White House, to the U.S. Senate, to a number of state departments of education, and to lots of school districts. He's often brought light to politically charged conversations. A good example of this is his recent book on value-added analysis. And what is remarkable among many things in the, about this book is that both Randy Weingarten and Rick Hess have endorsed this book. <laughs> Bill Gates. Bill Gates has endorsed this book. Uh, more recently, Doug has been focusing his efforts on the effects of the New Orleans school reforms and their implications for national schooling policy through his founding of the Education Research Alliance for New Orleans, which is also located at Tulane University. It is some of the work that Doug has been doing in New Orleans that he's going to share with us today, I think. He'll be talking for about an hour, and we'll leave about 15 to 30 minutes for discussions or questions. And if any of you want to connect with Doug uh, after that, we've got, he's got an appointment right after this, but we can find ways of connecting your questions or comments if we can't get them addressed during the course of the event. So please welcome Doug Harris. Uh -oh. All right, thanks Jim. Uh, I really appreciate being here. I've, I've always wanted, I've never been here before. I've never been to Charlottesville. So I'm glad to be here for the first time. Uh, Jim's uh, introduction was way too generous. I, I probably learned a lot of what I know from him because of this conference that we both uh, are a part of, the American Education, uh, well, we used to be American Education Finance Association, now AEFP, uh, where when I first came in, you know, Jim was uh, one of the, the senior uh, and most uh, well-recognized people, and, and so I learned a lot from, from him along the way, and I think everybody here should, should be uh, fortunate to, to have him here. I, I remember when you first came thinking, wow, so, something really big is going to happen at UVA uh, if Jim's going there. And I can see that it has happened with all of you here. So this is great. Uh, so I want, I'm really glad to be here to talk about uh, the work in New Orleans. Uh, it's a very interesting and un unusual case. Uh, well, I start off with acknowledgments, so just partly to show the size of the operation and the number of uh, people and organizations involved. Uh, we obviously, we have a large national research team. We'll be hiring this year if you're looking for a job. We're hiring postdocs, so these are, this is all, basically all postdocs uh, right now, and some of them are on the market looking for jobs, but we will hire to replace them. Uh, so that's important. We also have a national research team of other scholars uh, trying to get others uh, from other universities, including here, working on some of the work uh, that we're doing there. We have an advisory board. Now, the advisory board's really interesting because the, the contentiousness of New Orleans. So in New Orleans, uh, when I first went down there and I said, I'm here to, to study the reforms, I'm going to be objective, and I don't have a real opinion on it, everybody said, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's find out objective, we'll see what that really means. Uh, nobody uh, uh, believes that, that idea, nobody believes that you are, can not be on one side of this debate in New Orleans. I think we finally convinced them that that's not necessarily the case. But to make this work, we have to have a really wide variety of people. So we have the teachers unions on this. We also have the recovery school district, which is the, the organization that basically took over the schools and eliminated the teachers union. Uh, so you can imagine what our board meetings are like. It's pretty interesting. Uh, they're often going from court where they're suing one another to coming into our advisory board meeting where they're working sort of together. Uh, 
Another interesting part about this is that four of these organizations wouldn't exist really anywhere else in any other school system. So the recovery school district is one. So that's the state agency uh, where all the schools were moved uh, after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, so, so that's the main governing body now for most of the schools. And all the schools under the recovery school district are charter schools. The new schools for New Orleans, it was an incubator of charter schools. So it started up right after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and they were the ones trying to solicit proposals, trying to help people develop schools to, to come into New Orleans. The New Orleans Parents Guide was created a few years after the re reforms to provide information to parents. So one of the things they did uh, right after it was to eliminate attendance zones and they, everybody had to choose uh, with schools. There was, there was no default option anymore and there still isn't. So this guide was created and, and there's an organization supporting the guide and the, the data collection that goes into that. The uh, OPEN is the Orleans Paris Education Network, which is a group of community organizations that sort of banded together to try to influence the debate. Because now that it's the state that's running the system, there's no board to go to really anymore. There's still a, there's still a school district and still local elections, but that, that board doesn't control the vast majority of the schools. So this new organization was created as sort of a, a different way of getting voice into the conversation, a community voice into the debate about the schools. These are all, it's not just that they're on the advisory board that matters, but this is a good jumping off point for thinking about what kinds of new institutions get created and, and need to be created in this radically different system. Uh, so that's a good segue into thinking about what the, what the reform package is in New Orleans. So uh, I would say four main components. So one was the, the movement into the state agency and the switch over to charter schools. So now 93% of the schools are charter schools in New Orleans. Uh, and as, as part of that, then the teachers and leaders also changed in the system. So uh, it's now about 25% Teach for America. 67% uh, of school principals are former Teach for America. Uh, it's a, a very different teacher workforce than it was before. There's no tenure anymore. Certification is not required to be hired in a charter school. Uh, there's no union contract. The union contract is, was, uh, was let to expire and is been replaced. Uh, so all those things happen in a very short period of time. Uh, and, they're, and they're all connected to each other. So the charter schools uh, you know, were hiring these teachers and were, and were pushing for these kinds of reforms. So you can't really separate those two things. Choice and competition was important because a lot of the charter operators, especially the national operators, probably wouldn't have come in to the system if not for the fact that there was choice and the fact that they felt that they could attract and retain the kinds of students that they wanted and that would best fit their charter model. Test-based accountability is important because they actually shut down schools for low performance in New Orleans. Uh, and so they've shut down 10 strictly based on performance. Another 35 uh, were turned over to other operators under pressure uh, because they were low performing. So, so that's a lot in a school district that only has about 85 schools. Right? So you're talking about 45 schools have been shut down. Uh, and so that affects which charter schools are in the market. And then that affects which teachers are hired and the kinds of decisions that the schools are making. So that's why you see all these arrows, right? So it's a package of reforms. You can't separate one of these things from another. I can't say that it was all about the charter schools because these things are all connected to each other. Now, the one other piece that doesn't get much conversation, it really isn't something you think about as reform, is money. Uh, and there was a lot of additional money that went into the system at the beginning. Uh, it was $8,000 more per pupil in operating expenditures than similar districts. So it basically doubled operating expenditures for a while. Now, uh, but you know, 10 years later, it's about $1,000 more per pupil than similar districts. So it's still an increase in funding, plus $2 billion in, uh, in rebuilding uh, of the schools. So uh, we have to keep that part in mind as we're thinking about this. It wasn't just the reform package that might have generated outcomes. It was also the funding. So why does this matter? Uh, look at that prior list and all the things that changed. It's like a laundry list of all the reforms anybody's been talking about for the last 20 years uh, under this theme of both school autonomy and school accountability. So the idea of getting rid of tenure, of limiting the role of teachers unions and their contracts, of test-based accountability where we take over and turn around low-performing schools. This should all sound very familiar. And New Orleans is the only place where that's been done intensively all in one uh, so that's what I think makes it really important. Uh, it's also important to us working in New Orleans because of how this thing got put in place, right? It came in, in the aftermath of a horrible tragedy, and you can't drive around New Orleans, you can't talk to people in New Orleans without uh, having that in the back of your mind. 
So we're going to talk mostly about the first two questions. The first, uh, what have been the effects of the reforms on student achievement, uh, and, and to some degree other outcomes, although I have less data on other outcomes. Uh, and for whom does it work? So looking at the equity uh, side of this. The last two questions uh, we might not have uh, much time to cover, but we can touch on briefly. Uh, speaking of questions, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me at any point. Really, just raise your hand. Uh, some of you have read the paper that goes with this. Uh, and so you may already have a lot of questions in mind. And if I get to a point and it's a logical point, please just go ahead and raise your hand. All right, so when I first got to New Orleans, everybody, especially the pro-reform groups, pointed me to this picture. Right? These are the trends in performance in New Orleans pre and post Katrina. So this, is, this was 2005 here in the fall. This is when the hurricane hit. So beforehand, if you look at the yellow line, that's uh, Orleans Parish as a whole. And this light blue is Louisiana. And you can see a 24 percentage point gap in the percent who are basic and above. And by 2014, that was a six percentage point gap. And so reformers that basically declared victory and said, see, it worked. We don't need your research, right? Look, just look at the trends. That's all, that's all you need to know. Uh, obviously, all of you know better than this. And so there are specifically six problems we need to deal with uh, in, in trying to figure out what the actual effect was of that reform package. Population change is one. So after the hurricane, everybody had to leave. Uh, they shut down all the public housing projects. Uh, which made it hard for the lower income families to come back, at least initially. Uh, and the uh, lowest income neighborhoods were hardest hit. So the Lower Ninth Ward is the one everybody hears about, but uh, there certainly is a correlation between income and, uh, and the damage. And if your area was more heavily damaged, then it was also harder for you to come back. The second is distortion from test based accountability. So this is a general problem that we, we have whenever the stakes attached to a reform are really intense uh, and focused on, on outcomes, uh, that those outcomes may get distorted, that teaching to the test, cheating, those kinds of behaviors. Uh, the third is that students weren't in the New Orleans schools the whole time. So they were evacuated. Most of them uh, entered into other schools around the state and even in other states. And so it could be that anything, any changes in outcomes we see for students when they came back could be actually attributed to the schools they went to in that interim period. Uh, there were other changes in state policy, so No Child Left Behind was actually just starting to kick in uh, when the hurricane hit. So there were other pressures on low-performing schools at that point. Now, all those are going to tend to push the effects up uh, make, make, or, or make the effects look bigger than they really are when, when you look at those trend lines. There's also one factor that makes, makes the, uh, uh, the effects look too small. In other words, they're actually pushing down the estimated effect, and that's the trauma and disruption that went along with this. So, 80% uh, of the city was flooded, uh, students lost their homes, they lost their possessions, they lost their friends, they lost their social networks. Uh, they were, for at least a short period of time, many were separated from their families. It was an extremely traumatic event and a lot of psychology evidence about how much trauma there was and how much PTSD there is even years later. So that you all, all would expect to push scores down uh, in ways that are obviously not attributable to the reforms. And then we also always have to worry about changes in the test scale. So those are the six problems I would say we need to deal with. And the basic strategy we're going to use to deal with most of them is, is a quasi-experimental analysis. And we're going to do three different difference and difference uh, approaches here, and I'm going to explain them all here in a minute. And then we're going to have a comparison group. Uh, uh, so, so we're doing the difference and difference, but then the, the second difference is based on a comparison group that's matched based on, on some characteristics uh, of students and schools that I'll tell you about. I'm going to focus on the average treatment effects first, and then we'll go into how those effects vary by race and by income. Uh, so the one key thing I think to point out is that the idea of combining quasi-experimental methods together is really powerful. So if we just did difference and difference, say, comparing to the state as a whole, that would be an improvement. But the rest of Louisiana, if, if you know Louisiana at all, is nothing like Louisiana. Right? So that might not be a very good comparison group. And this is why adding matching onto difference and difference is, is really powerful. OK, so the data are like the state data systems you're used to seeing, student level data uh, from Louisiana Department of Education. Um, now, because this is a district level intervention, we have to think about that as the unit of analysis. So in most of the cases, what I'm reporting are standard errors uh, from uh, at, taking the student level data, aggregating up to the district level, and estimating conservative standard errors uh, that way. We're going to, back to 2002 up to 2012. I'd like to go more recent than 2012, but I didn't have the data. 
so uh, the, the uh, trials and tribulations of data access. We're working on it. Uh, so but it's actually, it's a nice stopping point because there are really different phases of the reform. So phase one was mostly what I described a minute ago. Uh, plus the, so this has included uh, eliminating attendance zones, eliminating the teachers union, eliminating tenure, uh, certification requirements. All that happened right at the beginning. Uh, but the schools were not all charter schools at the beginning. So that was really phase two. It took them a while to find charter operators to come in and take over the school. So that's phase two. And that's really what stopped in about 2012. By that point, almost everything was a charter school. And then a new phase of reforms uh, started at that point that I can talk about later if you're interested. So this is a nice uh, estimate then of the first two phases. Uh, we're only going through middle school because we don't have high school test scores that we can readily analyze. And we don't yet have the, the uh, high school graduation and college entry data that we need. Uh, but we're getting close. More trials and tribulations. So standard difference and difference model, we're looking at the effects <clears throat> of achievement, uh, that's A. The uh, gamma there is fixed effects for each district. D is pre and post reform. Uh, NOLA is, is NOLA. So we're interested in delta. And we're going to focus on the last year. So um, I'm actually not even going to report it this way. In the paper, if you read it, this is how it starts off. We look at the difference from, from pre-Katrina to the, the most recent year, 2012. Uh, and the reason for doing that is that we had good reason to think that it took a while for the reforms to take effect and to really uh, to, to, uh, to come into being uh, a potentially effective system. So you think about what it would take to start a school. Now imagine doing that 85 times and having to create an entirely new system and all these new organizations that I described earlier. That's going to take time. So you wouldn't expect to see an immediate effect. And so we don't do what's also common in difference and difference analysis, which is to average all the pre and post years together, for example. That doesn't make sense in this case, because we, we clearly expect there to be an improvement, not a, not a sudden shift. So instead, what we do is an event study analysis where we basically estimate the effect at each separate point in time. That's what this equation illustrates. <clears throat> so uh, there are two different ways, general strategies here. One is a panel analysis where we take the same students who were there pre-Katrina and uh, follow them over time. So th some of them came back so we can actually see the same student before and after the reforms were put in place. So the advantage obviously there is you can account for unobservable differences. The disadvantage is that it's a small sample. So it's, it, a lot of students didn't come back. Um, and we also run out of scores. So at some point, once the students hit eighth grade in the panel analysis, we can't go any further. We have to stop. So that's, uh, that's a big disadvantage, too. In the pool uh, analysis, the advantage is we never run out. There are always more cohorts that we can add in. The disadvantage is that we have to account for unobservable some other way. Let's talk about the matching. So one purpose of the matching is to deal with the trauma and disruption effect. So the first thing we did was to restrict the comparison group to trauma, uh, excuse me, to hurricane-affected districts where we expected there to be at least some degree of trauma. So there were actually two hurricanes. Uh, Hurricane Rita came about a month after Hurricane Katrina. And uh, so there were eight districts that were affected, including New Orleans. So we have seven comparison districts in that case. New Orleans was most heavily affected, or at least among the top two or three. So we wouldn't expect this to totally account for it, but the comparison of the state as a whole with the hurricane-affected districts gives us a sense of whether the trauma and disruption might have an effect. Uh, to address the, the policy changes like uh, No Child Left Behind and, and the implementation of No Child Left Behind, uh, we wanted to find schools and students who were at about the same achievement level, right? Because, because of the way that No Child Left Behind is designed, it's focused on students with lower, lower scores. So we're going to, in those hurricane affected districts, then we'll match to uh, students who have similar pre treatment scores. Uh, and that's especially important because uh, pre Katrina New Orleans had. Uh, much lower scores in other districts, too. So it's not only that we want, we want to match and we would always want to match, but that there's a common support problem here, which means there was no other district that was nearly as low performing as New Orleans that we can use as a comparison. So <clears throat> you have to keep that in mind when we interpret it. We made it harder to get good matches. <clears throat> All right, in the panel analysis, the matching is pretty simple, and we actually do it two different ways. Because there we can match at the student level, and we can match based on on pre-Katrina characteristics. So what we do is we go into each district, each comparison district separately, and, and look at one student in New Orleans, and then let's go and find a student in that other district who matches pretty well, call that a match. With, and then we're going to match with replacement, so that student goes back into the pool, 
We do that for every student in New Orleans. So in, in many cases, we end up with a smaller number of students in the comparison district that we're matching uh, to New Orleans. And then we aggregate that up and call that a pseudo district. Right? So all the students who we matched in that comparison district, we'll call that uh, a pseudo district, and then do that separately for every district. And that's going to give us uh, the comparison group in that case. Did So we do that, we, we focus more on the school characteristics in the, uh, in the pool of analysis. So I'll show you that. This is just at the student level so far. And then we did this two different ways. So first we matched just on test scores because we think that test scores are the most important thing to match on, right? The, the best predictor of your future outcome is your prior outcome in the same measure. So we focused just on matching on test scores. Then we did another version of this where we also matched on grade, re grade retention, meaning whether a student had been retained in grade. Uh, their year of return to New Orleans because not everybody came back at the same time. And one demographic measure. So one, one version we do race, that's the version I'm going to show you. Another version we do it with free and reduced lunch. So the sacrifice when you go to version B is that the match on test scores is, isn't going to be as good because in the matching process it's considering all of these factors. Uh, yeah, Jim. Did you guys consider thinking about matching on trends in students? We, did, we did do it based on, on trends. Yeah, I should have said that. OK, because we, because we want to get parallel trends, right? That's our, our main uh, test of validity for this kind of analysis. In the pooled analysis, it's more complicated because you can't match based on post-reform or post-treatment information. So what we did was we identified schools, whole schools, pre-Katrina, uh, that had similar characteristics to New Orleans schools. And then we took the students who were in those schools post-Katrina. Right? So we didn't take into account any of the post-Katrina information except whether the student were, was in that school or not post-Katrina. Uh, that's, so that's to avoid matching on any post-treatment information. But the sacrifice there is that we match much more poorly, right? Because at the, at the school level, it's hard to find schools that were as low performing as the schools in, in New Orleans. It was easy to find individual students in the panel, so we don't match as well uh, on levels. We still have parallel trends, but we don't match as well on levels when we do this. All right, so the identifying assumption is the usual. Uh, you know, we have the, this counterfactual that the treatment group would have followed the same path as the control group in the absence of the reforms, and that, that gives us the parallel trends assumption, and we're going to test that uh, using uh, the, the event study analysis that I, that I showed you as well as uh, some other methods. So just to rehash where we are methodologically, right? We have a lot of things going on, so just to sort of summarize what we've dealt with with the matching process. The matching process helps us deal with interim schools, with other changes in state policy, with trauma disruption, and with changes in the test scale. It doesn't completely solve all those problems, but it at least starts to address those problems. The two we haven't addressed that I'm going to talk about later are population change and distortions from test-based accountability. All right, so this is just a plot. This is just descriptive. This is not difference in difference. Uh, showing trends and scores in New Orleans over time. So it's like the Cowan Institute figure that I showed you, that pretty picture that I showed early on, except now we're in, we're in effect size uh, world uh, where we're normalized to, to uh, normal distribution, mean zero, standard deviation one for the state as a whole. And this just shows you that it kind of looks like that prior picture, right? That the scores went up a lot. And they went up, if, you, if you average these across grades and across subjects, increased by about 0.4 standard deviations, which is a big, big change. We're not used to seeing uh, changes like that. And this is just, that was math. This just shows the same thing for other subjects. So you can see significant improvements. OK, so that's just uh, to start us getting us moving towards the difference in difference. So here are the actual results now for panel A. So remember, this is the one where we matched only on test score, um, on test scores and not on the other thing. So this is the. Students who were fourth graders in 2005, just before the hurricane and, and the last score we could observe, who came back in 2006, which is the first year they could have come back. We did this separately for each grade and for each year of return, but they look fairly similar. Fifth grade looks a little bit different than fourth grade. A couple observations here. One is parallel trends look good, right? So this is the panel, so this looks good. It doesn't look as good, uh, quite as good in the pooled. Then there's a dip. Uh, so there are a couple different reasons why this might have occurred. So one is that it's possible initially that the schools were actually worse uh, and they got better, right? Because they're putting this new system in, into place. They, they could have been uh, not very good schools. Another is the trauma and disruption effects could still be operating at this 
and that may have pulled things down. But you do see an upward trajectory. Um, so this is just math, and if we add the other subjects in here, ELA looks pretty similar. You get the dip and upward trend. This is science, similar, uh, although a bigger drop and not quite as steep. Uh, social studies didn't have as much of a dip. Trajectory there. Okay, so that's panel version A. Now, if you look just through 2009, the effects look pretty small, actually. So these actually average out, if you average across the fourth and fifth grade cohorts and across subjects uh, and across years of return, it averages to about zero, actually. This, these, these ones here average a little bit above zero, but it doesn't look that positive. It looks like an upward trend, but still not much going on by 2009. Now this is panel version B, so the method actually, the matching method matters, because now the results look more positive. There's not as much of a dip here, and the effect is now more positive than it was before. So we do this uh, for the others again. We've got same story, dip, but positive, dip, uh, large positive here, not much of a dip. But now we average these together, we get about a, a uh, 0.15 to 0.2 standard deviation effect by 2009. So the matching method does seem to matter here. We don't, at this point, have a strong preference, and we're not sure which one that we should, uh, we should believe between the, just between those two. Um, but the one thing that is consistent, at least, is that there's this upward trend. So now here's the pooled. So in the pooled, it looks different in a couple different dimensions. One is we don't see a dip. We very rarely, in any of the pooled analyses, see the dip. It, it looks like more of a a sharp increase, and the effects are, end up being larger. So here now we're at, at 0.4 already, which was ba basically would explain the entire upward trend uh, over time. And if we do this again by subject, you see similar thing for, uh, for science, ELA, social studies. These are, again, big effects looking at the pool. Okay, we did a lot of robustness checks, so the other robustness checks didn't matter. The things that matter are how you match and whether it's panel or pooled. Whether we aggregate at the student level, or aggregate to the district level, or do it at the student level with, with clustered standard errors, doesn't matter. Uh, whether we add a, a covariate for whether students were retained in grade, whether we add covariates for student demographics, whether we add bin indicators to deal with the stratification and the matching process, none of that matters. We also tried some other strategies. One was to use district switchers. So even before Katrina, you could, you'd have some students moving into New Orleans. And then you'd have people moving into New Orleans after, and so you could uh, look at the, the district switch before and after to see whether moving into New, New Orleans after Katrina was better than moving into New Orleans before Katrina. Um, and you can also do the reverse of that, whether moving out of New Orleans ends up being uh, worse for you after Katrina. Uh, we actually get pretty positive results from that strategy, similar to what we get from the pooled. Uh, we also did a comparative interrupted time series version of this, which is actually not very different from the, the event study. Also gives similar results to pooled, and actually should say panel B, not panel A there. So basically all these methods give us towards the more positive end of the, the results that I showed you earlier. Hey, ben. Well, so the question is whether there was an improvement. So let, let's just, let's, we'll take the out switcher example. So pre-Katrina, somebody could have left, and we can observe them before and after the switch, but where both of those periods are in the pre-reform. And New Orleans was worse in a value-added sense pre-Katrina. So if you left New Orleans, you usually did better. The question is whether that difference changed post-Katrina. And the way it looks in the results is leaving New Orleans was worse for you after the reforms, suggesting that the reforms improve the schools. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, in terms of funding? Uh, I think it's easy just to take the funding differences as sort of bottom line, how much money did they have to spend, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, but generally, no. There was some emergency funding that came into New Orleans, some of it philanthropic money, uh, but the state didn't change things very much. Okay, so so far, you're probably thinking, eh, I'm not sure what to make of this. Uh, and we weren't either. So for panel A, the results averaged to about zero. For panel B, averaged to about 0.2. And for the pool, they averaged about 0.4. Obviously, those are, those are different. So the question is, why are they different? So one obvious reason is that the time frame here is different, right? So the, the panel analysis only goes to 2009. 
uh, and the pooled goes, goes later. Uh, the trauma and disruption might be biasing the panel downward because uh, when we're, we're matching only on returnees, returnees probably had a worse trauma disruption effect than the, than the overall sample. So that could be pulling down uh, the results in the pooled, or excuse me, in the panel relative to the pooled. And population change. So the pooled could, might be upwardly biased because population changed and we haven't accounted for that yet. So let me deal with those next three things. So this is now lining up, these, are, these two figures are the figures I already showed you earlier for panel, uh, actually it should say panel B, I made that same mistake again. So that's panel B, this is matching on, on everything in the pool. Now I'm just lining up the years, so you can see the difference in what we did here. So now this is lining up 2009, this is a point, uh, one five effect, this is about a point two nine effect. So this one is still bigger than this one, much more in the same direction. In fact, when, when you average them, across grades and, and subjects and so on, it ends up looking uh, pretty similar. The, the panel B looks a little bit lower than the pool, but not by much. All right, so clearly, the, the number of years involved seems to be a big part of the explanation for the differences. Uh, the interim schools and the trauma and disruption. Now, it's hard to separate these two things uh, empirically, but it is possible to get a net effect of those two things. Uh, and uh, there's a RAND study that actually did this right after the reforms, and they estimated a net effect of a, a negative 0.03 to negative 0.09 standard deviation, meaning uh, that students who left uh, New Orleans, they ended up losing uh, a little bit. So part of it was they were gaining on the interim school side, but they were losing on the trauma side, and so the net effect of all that s seemed to be negative, meaning the trauma effects seemed to be winning out over the interim school effect. Um, so that would suggest that we're, the trauma and disruption might, in that dip, it might be actually a downward uh, bias in the, in the, uh, uh, the panel results. Uh, but that might fade out over time. So maybe now when we look at the later years, we would expect the trauma and disruption to have less of an impact. Okay, population change. This is the one that I, we've spent, I'd say, the most time de uh, dealing with. So this is just comparing 2004 or five demographics just before to 11, 12, and we're gonna focus especially on race and free and reduced lunch. So you see, this is the, the, the means for the two years and this is the difference. So not much change here uh, in racial demographics and also uh, not a huge change in free and reduced lunch. The, the percentage it actually goes in the wrong, the wrong direction from what people expected. Right? Because if you expected uh, the closing of the housing projects and the effects on the lower income neighborhoods to uh, uh, make things more advantaged, more uh, higher income, uh, then you would expect the percent free and reduced lunch to have dropped, but it actually went up, All right? Now, I don't quite believe this because uh, one thing I learned pretty recently is that uh, free and reduced lunch, you can be eligible for it if you're considered homeless, and you can be considered homeless if you're not in a permanent home. So after Katrina, very few people were in a permanent home. So you probably had some relatively high income people who were eligible for free and reduced lunch at that point in time. So we don't quite believe this, but this was our starting point anyway. So we did something else, which was to look at, uh, among the returnees, looked at their pre-Katrina scores to see whether those who came back had, uh, had scores that were higher than the overall pre-Katrina sample. So if everybody had come back, we would be at this red line. The, the, population of the pre-Katrina scores would look exactly the same as before because everybody came back. But at the beginning, it looks like the story played out just like the previous time. There were more advantaged students who came back with much higher pre-Katrina scores than those who, who didn't come back. But over time, and this is cumulative, so now we're adding the 2007 and 2006 returnees here. So now you start to get uh, more local scoring pre-Katrina students coming back. And by the time you get to 2010, now you're only about 0 0.02, 0 0.03 standard deviations. Now remember, the effect sizes here we're talking about are possibly 0.4 standard deviations. So looking at this analysis, it doesn't look like that could be much of an explanation uh, for the results. But we still don't quite believe this because these are only returnees. So it could be that the newbies, the people who came to New Orleans who weren't there uh, beforehand, maybe they were different somehow. So we had to do something else. So we got the census data and did a simulation like this. So the first thing we did was to calculate the changes in census measures like income levels. Uh, and and uh, so, so this wasn't just relying on free and reduced lunch type measures. This is actual income information from census. And we could do that relative to the comparison group. 
Then separately, we estimated using the ECLS, the Early Childhood Longitudinal Study from, uh, from the US Department of Education, which has the same census measures in it. Uh, we estimated the relationship between the census measures and student test scores. And then we put one and two together and said, all right, what, let's do an out of sample prediction. Given the changes in the census measures we see uh, in New Orleans, what's the predicted effect on test scores from those changes in demographics? All right, so that's the process. Now let me show you how it turns out. So th these are the changes uh, in New Orleans and Jefferson Parish, which is, is right next door. And this was kind of a middle ground uh, parish in terms of the changes in their demographic information. So we think this is a pretty reasonable approx approximation. Uh, in New Orleans, income went down, but in Jefferson Parish, it went down more. Uh, and you see a similar pattern, actually, for all these measures. So percent BA, the difference in difference for New Orleans uh, improved. So uh, the, the number of BA recipients went up by 10 percentage points, or the share went up by 10 percentage points. And it also went up in other places, but it went up more in New Orleans. So bottom line is New Orleans did become more socioeconomically advantaged. Now the question is, how much does this matter? So the next step is these are the results from the ECLS regression. So this is just estimating the, the relationship between these same measures. So the effect of income now on test score levels here and the effect on test score gains here. And this is just the coefficient from that regression. So the between these socioeconomic measures and test scores. And then we're, so we multiply those two together so we can get this change times this coefficient gives us a 0 0.006 standard deviation in gains that, for that particular one. Then, last but not least, then we do that for all of these different categories. So we have it, the predicted effect on levels, the predicted effect on gains, and then we can combine these. So this particular cumulative effect of test scores uh, is taking third grade levels and then assuming the student's in the school for five years and take the effect on gains, add all that up to get the predicted effect on test scores. So that's what, that's what we're doing here, is getting that predicted effect of being, of being more socioeconomically advantaged and being in a, in a school system uh, for about the same number of years as the students in New Orleans had been. The long, convoluted process uh, it ends up, if you add or average all these together, it ends up being almost exactly what I showed you so yes, it's slightly more socioeconomically advantaged. The predicted effect from that simulation is about there. And, and this is showing it here. So very slight differences. So that gives us pretty good confidence. Now we've done it three different ways, right? We looked at the administrative data, we look at the, the test scores of the returnees, and we do the census simulation. And we, it, all of them are basically telling us the same thing. Um, so that gives us confidence that the pooled analysis is probably not upwardly biased because of the population change. All right, so now let me skip back forward again. All right, so now I've dealt with four, the first four things with the matching process, and I've now dealt with population change. Now, we haven't talked about the distortions from test-based accountability yet. So this is hard to deal with because in New Orleans, unlike Florida, we don't have an audit test. We don't have some low-stakes test that we can compare with. Uh, so that's unfortunate. So what we did instead was to leverage the fact that the stakes on social studies and science were somewhat lower, at least in some grades and subjects, than they were in math and reading. So we looked at them by subject. It actually turns out there's no difference at all looking at them by subject. So that gives us some confidence that what we're seeing is not just uh, teaching to the test and, and test distortion. Let me just pause for a second. Any questions anybody wants to bring up at this point? I know I'm throwing a lot at you. I get to get a drink. OK, keep going. All right, so to summarize, uh, the reforms seem to have produced large effects. So we don't know exactly what range. But I would say in, it explains probably between 50 and 100% of the total improvement, somewhere in that range. It's a, it's a wide range, but even if you take the low end of that range, it's pretty big. Um, and even if you take the more pessimistic view, the interesting thing here is there's no other theory for why the scores went up. So even the critics of the reforms don't say, uh, oh, the scores went up because this other thing happened. Nobody has a theory for why the scores went up. This is another key factor, I think, in the interpretation here. All right, so now let's talk about uh, heterogeneity. So how does this play out now when we look at subgroups? Uh, this is a big deal because a lot of the press around New Orleans has been around the idea that disadvantaged students were harmed. Uh, they were treated badly, that especially special education students were treated badly, uh, and that there was, the schools were pushing out low-performing students. We actually released a study showing that principals acknowledged doing this kind of thing. Uh, so th there's definitely reason to worry about that. 
Uh, there's always reason to worry about it, but especially in this case. So there are some challenges to doing this kind of analysis. We always have the, the multiple comparisons problem uh, that when you start breaking them up into subgroups, you might be bound to find uh, some differences in, in some subgroups. Uh, but we also have some distinctive problems here. Uh, so what we, what we did, first of all, is a somewhat different stratification, or excuse me, matching process. We, it's basically the same matching process that we, we did before, but except now we're only comparing the subgroups to one another. We're only comparing black to black, white to white, free and reduced lunch to free and reduced lunch. We're not matching on it, we're stratifying on it. Um, in the pooled, we also had to do the additional uh, uh, thing of finding s schools that were, had enough students who were both free and reduced, free and reduced lunch and non-free and reduced lunch. Uh, uh, so that was another part of the matching process. Um, another problem here is that uh, several of the variables we're interested in here are endogenous. So free and reduced lunch and special ed in particular, right, that's part of the reform effect could be that it changed the way in which people ended up in those programs. And we actually have some anecdotal evidence that that happened. So it could be that even though we're comparing free and reduced lunch before to free and reduced lunch after, especially in the pooled analysis, that those might not be a very good match because of the way in which the program is administered in different ways. Now that's only a problem in the pooled analysis because that's the one uh, where we're, we're having to match based on the post-Katrina information. In the panel analysis, we're still matching only based on pre-Katrina information. So we look at whether they were free and reduced lunch before the reforms, and we're matching only on that to, to avoid, uh, to continue to avoid matching on post-Katrina information. So the problems here are mostly a problem with the pool, not with the panel. All right, so here's what we see with the panel and the pool. This is for black-white differences. So the black scores are the black line, if you can't see that, and the red line are for the white students. So it looks like uh, black students benefited, but the, the white students benefited more in terms of achievement growth. And that shows up in all these pictures, no matter how we did it, no matter what subject we look at, it does look like white students benefited more from the reforms uh, than black students. The one case where that might not be the case here is in the, uh, the pooled math, black, black and white. Uh, but even there, by the end of this, it's also partly true there, too. All right, so there's some reason to worry that, that whites benefited more, but it's also important to recognize that it looks like everybody benefited. So there are no negative point estimates here by the end for black. They're, all, they're always positive, it's not as big. Uh, final thing I want to emphasize is there are only about four or five percent of students in New Orleans who are white in the public schools. So it's a, that red line is a very small number of people. Okay, <clears throat> this is based on free and reduced lunch, same exercise, free and reduced lunch. A similar pattern in the pooled, so the free and reduced lunch students seem to have uh, smaller effects than the non-free and reduced lunch, and that, that shows up in both of these. Uh, also, you'll notice a dip. It's the same dip we saw before, here and here. So we, we looked into evidence that it, it could be that those students had bigger trauma and disruption effects, that, that low-income students would have had bigger trauma. Uh, and we find some evidence of that from the psych psychology literature, and people who have studied post-Katrina uh, New Orleans. So it could be that that's part of what's going on. And the trajectories are actually reasonably similar. So it could be if it, this was trauma and disruption, and if, in a, if that persisted over time, then that could explain what's going on. Uh, but we can't, we can't know that for sure. Now the pooled analysis, here the results are not consistent the way they were with race. With the race results, if I went back and you saw it, they were basically the same pattern for both. But the pool, it looks different. And I think it has to do with this issue of the problem with the free and reduced lunch measure. So if you look here with math, you see that non-free and reduced lunch students were very low performing and free and reduced lunch students were high performing. But remember, if you're homeless, but in, in that homeless definition uh, that you are uh, not in a permanent home, then you probably have some high income students here, which is pulling this up. And this ends up being a flatter line because as those students move out, so eventually they become not free and reduced lunch anymore. They move out of that category. Uh, and so you're, it's pull, that's pulling down the, the growth curve. That's, that's why that one's flatter. Whereas with this red line, the non-free and reduced lunch students, you're now pulling the higher income students into that group, and that's shooting up their scores. We think that's the likeliness on there. So in this case, we believe the, the panel more than we believe the pooled. All right, now what? So what, is, what do we take away from all this? There's a lot going on here. 
So we went about kind of a bounding exercise to try to think about uh, the sizes of these, um, this, these effects. So one possibility is to say, well, we believe that panel A is unbiased. Uh, and if that's the case, we can take the difference between the 2009 uh, pooled analysis and the 2009 panel A, and that's an estimate of our bias. That turns out to be about 0.18 standard deviations. And we can just ex sort of extrapolate that bias forward to the 2012. If we do that, we get a, a, an effect of 0.2 standard deviations. For the upper bound, there are two ways to get to an effect of about 0.4 standard deviations. One is that we believe the panel B and the pooled are unbiased, or that the difference between panel A and panel B and pooled is all bias in panel A. So e either set of assumptions uh, gets you to uh, the same conclusion. So that's why we end up, it's a, again, wide range. A 0.2 standard deviation range is wide. But the thing that's really helpful here uh, that I didn't quite expect is even the lower bound is big. Right? So if I just came to you and said we found a, a 0.2 standard deviation effect and we found it everywhere, you'd probably say, wow, that's a big effect. Uh, so at this point, it looks like that's probably a lower bound. And it could actually be larger than that. <clears throat> All right, so that's the summary. Uh, let, me, let me talk about some other things. So we're trying to be as, as confident. This is a high stakes operation, right? So there's a lot of attention being paid in New Orleans. We didn't want to draw a conclusion that eventually was going to, that we weren't going to believe, right? So we wanted to look at other outcomes, piece together uh, lots of different kinds of evidence here. So we're mainly interested really in long-term outcomes anyway. So if we had had the college outcomes, we would have just jumped right to that. But we didn't. So instead what we did is we looked at the, the Louisiana Department of Education reports uh, that showed just descriptively. We could sort of do a, a diff and diff in our heads based on what they were reporting. Uh, and it looks like the difference in difference between New Orleans and the state as a whole on college entry before and after Katrina uh, increased college entry by about uh, 13 percentage points, which is big. It, it increased it by like 40 percent increase in college entry. That's big. So the main supply side effect, I think, is the cut in funding of colleges in, in Louisiana. So there, the funding was being cut as this was happening. And so if anything, it was less attractive to go to college. So these, these uh, especially in, in New Orleans, let me think about that. Well, so this is difference in difference. So the whole state was affected. So I actually forget what I just said. Um, it's hard to say in a difference in different sense whether I would expect there to be any effect here, because the whole state was affected by that, and that's our comparison group. Uh, but I don't think, in terms of who's coming, in terms of what students are coming in, is that what you're getting at? I think it goes back to the population change story. It doesn't look like there was much population change. Uh, so I wouldn't expect that to be playing much of a role, which is one reason why we have a little bit more confidence in this. So if, if we had found in the population change analysis that New Orleans had become relatively much more socioeconomically advantaged, then I wouldn't believe these numbers. But the fact that it didn't become much more socioeconomically advantaged in a difference in different sense suggests that that's probably not what's going on. What about the actual effect of Katrina on admissions decisions by colleges, whereby they say, you know, here's trauma that I faced and I, here's how I dealt with it. That's interesting. Colleges might be more sympathetic to people who right. experienced it. That's an interesting theory, although I wouldn't expect that to affect whether you went to college because if, if students are applying, you know, Feel free to college access people to tell me if this doesn't make any sense. Uh, it, most students are going to apply to a range of colleges. And if, if they don't, the competitive ones, the ones that, where they might not get in, if they don't end up getting in, they're probably going to end up somewhere else. Reasonable? Yep, no, I agree. That's actually really interesting. I think it can, aren't they, can they, can they increase or are they automatic ESG zero? Um, you may see it, it'd be interesting to see whether the shock to hell was, um, it's hard, I, 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 I it's, can't I don't think it 
don't think it does, does it? I don't, I don't think it does. Directly, does it? I mean, they're correlated, obviously, but I don't know. Um, that's an interesting theory. So, again, looking at the whole package, though, which is kind of what I'm trying to get us to do, is to look at all of these outcomes together and say, all of them are pointing in a very positive direction. Right? Everything looks positive. Uh, it's, so you can, you, can, you can definitely attack any individual piece of evidence here, but it's, I, to me, I, I find it hard to attack the overall story because it's uh, so uh, strong, the, the effects seem to be large, uh, and it would be hard to tell a story that would turn all these things small, I think. All right, so in the coming months, we're trying to get the data so we can actually analyze these things ourselves. Um, one worry, so the, the one uh, caveat I'll say that I think is the biggest issue right now in my mind is that there's some evidence that uh, schools were assigning students to uh, an out-of-state transfer category that was making the, the high school dropout rate look too small. So if, once you do that, it takes them out of your pool for the school. They're no longer in the denominator anymore. So if they were doing that, then that's making the, it's making the high school graduation numbers look too high. It's also making the college entry numbers look too positive because if they're kind of pushing out low-performing students, calling them out-of-state transfers, then the, the, the denominator there is only high school graduates. Then it could just be that more advantaged graduates uh, were, were getting through high school, and then that's making things look more positive on the college entry, too. So th that, to me, is the biggest question mark I have right now. So we're waiting on the data to, to dig into that. Um, so I mentioned beginning the resources and cost effectiveness side of this, and this is something that I did a lot of uh, for a time uh, earlier in my career, and so I mentioned these numbers and these, these sharp increases in funding. Uh, the question now is think about these effects relative to the costs, right? So is it, 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 was a, it was a large investment, now was it worth it or not? So what I did here was to, com to compare and to create effect cost effectiveness ratios for New Orleans relative to uh, some, some comparable, well not, I wouldn't say comparable, to other programs where we can do the same thing. So this paper I wrote in 2009 in IPA, where I just basically did a, a review of studies where we had rigorous evidence in, for which we could also calculate costs, and then created uh, comparable, and it showed how to create uh, comparable effectiveness cost ratios. This is, these are short-term effects, meaning that these are uh, based on test scores captured right after the intervention took place. And that's also true of what's going on in New Orleans. So this is really the most comparable column. And what we find is a, an adjusted short-term cost-effectiveness ratio of 4.2, which sits above success for all and sits above uh, class size reduction by a considerable amount. There are a few in this list uh, that have higher adjusted cost-effectiveness ratios, uh, but they're ones that where the, the potential effect magnitude is pretty small because the, the, basically these ratios are large be because the resources were so low, not because the effect was so large. So in other words, the, this one sort of sits in the middle of this list, but it's of all the ones in there, it probably it's, has the potential to generate the largest potential total impact. And I also did a similar version of this for col where college outcomes were the goal of the programs. Uh, and so this, this is a, a list, I'm not gonna go through all the programs, but basically then this is also an effectiveness cost ratio for all these individual programs. And try to put New Orleans on the list, assuming that those the numbers reported by the state are correct about who's going to college and the effect on college outcomes. Uh, the other important caveat here is that some of these are college access programs, and these calculations don't account for the effect of getting students to graduate from high school, which a lot of college outcomes, a lot of college access programs actually affect that outcome as well. So this is only the, the benefits of getting more years of college. And if we put New Orleans on that list, it ends up being about there which puts it, again, above a lot of the standard stuff, like uh, loans, merit aid, uh, the opening doors experiment that MDRC did actually shows a um, little bit more positively. This, uh, uh, this is a student services estimate, mostly from sort of fancy regression analysis. Uh, this is a remediation estimate from uh, Vettinger and Long, which is much more like kind of off the charts positive. Uh, so New Orleans uh, sits kind of in the middle of that distribution. Uh, so above, above some that are standard, but below other, uh, other interesting programs that are now being considered nationally. All right, so now, now I'm basically done. How are we doing on time? 
pretty good on time. All right. Um, so I would say, I, I, to my surprise, I thought going into this exercise, knowing how many methodological problems we were going to have, I thought coming out of this, there was going to be no way I'd be able to say anything with any confidence. But actually, I feel pretty confident that this had a substantial increase in, uh, in academic outcomes for students. It may have had other side effects, you know, things that we haven't talked about here, like uh, you know, taking away from culturally relevant uh, content, taking away from the arts, uh, definitely a concern. Um, uh, it may, it, certainly some students were treated badly, and definitely some of the stories that I've heard, and I don't think even the reformers would question these stories. Like some really bad things happened to some students uh, as a result of these reforms. So I don't want to kind of downplay those individual horror stories, but trying to, at the same time, look at the, the picture as a whole. <clears throat> all the subgroups appear to have benefited, uh, although not all at the same level. Again, the more disadvantaged students seem to have benefited less. Um, intermediate outcomes uh, also changed a lot, so we didn't get a chance to talk about this uh, for sake of time, but we, we have a whole range of studies uh, ongoing about how instructional practice changed, how parents were choosing schools, how school principals responded to competition, how the teacher workforce changed. So a lot of these are already on our website uh, if you want to see those details, but basically it's, it's plausible when you think about the kinds of things that were changing inside schools and charter management organizations that it could have generated an effect like this because there was a lot going on. It wasn't that nothing else changed. That there was a lot going on in all of those different mechanisms. Um, the effects are pretty large relative to most, I would say, I should say common policies and, and estimates of their cost. Um, and I th again, the main caveat here, I think, is the test-based accountability and the fact that, uh, especially on, on uh, high school graduation, college entry, and maybe also the test scores themselves, that there's a little bit of data manip manipulation going on here uh, that we haven't quite captured. That's it. <laughs> Questions? A lot of people care about it, and as you pointed out, it's a contentious issue there, and so bringing some real evidence to bear on that, I think, is, is really important. Talk to me a little bit about why we should care about this outside the world. Right. No, that's a great question. So uh, I thought about this even before I started the project. Because partly I had to figure out for myself, is it worth putting all this time into starting the center to, to, to do this? Uh, and I think there are several things that convinced me uh, that it's relevant. So one is, well, actually, let me take the, the counter argument and take your argument further. So there are reasons to think this is not going to generalize. One reason is New Orleans was an extremely low-performing dysfunctional district, even by urban district standards, right? So the FBI had a field office in the school district. There was so much corruption. Uh, the, the school board president went to jail. Uh, they went through nine superintendents in eight years uh, before Katrina. It was terrible. Uh, it was really So dis districts that are more functional are probably going to benefit less from this uh, than New Orleans. Uh, second thing is, because it came on the heels of Katrina, there was a lot of uh, national interest, uh, sort of outpouring of support for the city. So people wanted to come. Teachers wanted to move to the city. School leaders wanted to move to the city in ways that other cities are not going to get. So Baton Rouge is trying to do the same, same thing. The recovery school district operates in Baton Rouge. They can't get people to go to Baton Rouge. Uh, so th that's something that's not going to generalize. To other places. So I think one way to think about this is it's probably an upper bound estimate of what's, what, what would happen in other places. So even, even the upper bound estimate, of, the upper bound of the upper bound is uh, what I'm talking about here. So I don't think the effects would be as large in most other places as they are. But the fact that, uh, that they may, were able to make these kinds of changes, to me, when I see what's going on there, it makes me question assumptions about what a system can look like. Uh, I mean, I think um, when I talk to people who've, who've looked at school reform for a long time, they're coming at it with a bunch of assumptions that I think New Orleans disproves about what a system can look like, you know, what, on how parents are making choices on um, what, what a district needs to do, right? So some people will say, well, if you don't have a school district, what, you know, you're going to lose economies of scale and transportation. Well, 
yeah, so cost of transportation went up, but the, the CMO leaders say that it's been extremely beneficial because now they can control their schedule, they can control their hours um, much more easily than they could before. There would not have been that flexibility before. Uh, they also use bus time actually as uh, sometimes instructional time, sometimes a kind of acculturation to school values. So, um, so I think just looking at it in terms of strictly economies of scale doesn't work very well. Another example is uh, a lot of the uh, charter schools have banded together into informal networks to do uh, bulk purchasing. Uh, they, they, there's one charter, it's KIPP actually, facilitates group food purchase for lots of schools that, that want to. So a lot of the things that we worry about happening uh, in a tr when you go to a system like this, I think New Orleans is showing ways in which those things can be overcome. So that's a sense in which it's not saying everybody else should go do it, it's just showing you a, a, a totally different way of operating that might not be quite as bad as it seems, and that there are ways in which the district doesn't always have to do everything, that there are ways in which schools can do things for themselves that we probably haven't thought of before. What do you think of that answer? Um, so uh -huh. I think, I'm not disagreeing with anything yeah. you said, yeah. but so two, two different lines of, of questions that are front and forth. There was reform efforts underway, sorry. Mm -hmm reform efforts underway pre-Katrina, right? And so, but my understanding, and you know this better, is that you might, relative to what occurred as a result of Katrina, call those changes marginal. Right. But, but those are probably much more like the kind of changes that you could expect to make. So is the message we should have Katrinas everywhere because no. you're not going to get... No, that's not the message. Arne Duncan, the, the, the most famous quote from Arne Duncan, at least in New Orleans, is something like, Katrina was the best thing that ever happened to New Orleans. No, but, yeah. I, yeah. but I think, yeah. I won't yeah, speak yeah. for the secretary, but, yeah. um, <laughs> but I, I think the argument is you couldn't have gotten rid of unions and tenure and all the things right. that Katrina allowed to occur, yeah. which maybe right. So, okay, so this is, this take, this is the, what I'll call po political generalizability, right? So there's effectiveness generalizability. If you could do it, what would the effect be? That's, that's the way I answered the question at first. What you're talking about is political generalizability. Could you do it somewhere else? Uh, in the short term, probably not, but I tend to take sort of the long view on this and, and like to point out that the, the system that we have in place now, the traditional system, was novel 100 years ago, and who knows what's going to happen next. So I, I, I tend to take the long view uh, on this sort of thing, and I agree that in the short term, it's very unlikely that anybody will do something as intensively as New Orleans did. But there are 27 plus districts that are very aggressively looking at New Orleans and trying to do it uh, at this point. So, uh, and I don't see any abatement in that. It seems like that's only going to accelerate. So it might take a very long time, uh, and I'm not saying we, that's even necessarily the right way to go, but if school systems decide to continue doing that, I could imagine a lot of New Orleans 50 years from now. <coughs> attempting to look at variation, I guess, within schools, within New Orleans in terms of you have numbers of different types of charter schools. There's probably variation in terms of approaches that they adopt using a diff and diff strategy. So, the, yeah, there, isolate some of these th th there's a team at MIT that is trying to, and has been for a long time, trying to figure out the sort of characteristics of effective charter schools. That might be one way to look at it. So the, the one theme that's come out of that is the idea of no excuses. Charter schools seem to generate larger effects than, than others. Uh, so partly we're letting them do that. Um, partly, I, I don't think in New Orleans that's the most interesting question, partly because that's a question we could ask elsewhere. I don't think there's anything, there are charter schools all over the place now, and so we can go look at the characteristics of, of effective schools in other places just as well as we can in New Orleans. And I think what we're trying to focus the research agenda is on things that you could really only study in New Orleans. So, um, so, uh, so we haven't done a lot of that uh, at this point. Uh, it's almost, yeah, 15 to 20,000. It's definitely smaller. Um, actually, very little. There's almost no change, at least in the people-teacher ratio. We can't actually calculate class size directly, but there's very little change in the people-teacher ratio. Okay. I thought that might be, it could, be, it could have been an important factor. Yeah, we, look, we looked at it. Yeah, we, we, we've been looking at uh, from every angle we possibly can, and I, I'm, I've only given you, believe it or not, this is like, 5% of what we've done over the last uh, year and a half. 
how are kids doing in these schools? You mean how are they feeling about how they're doing? How are they? Do, how is their overall yeah, well-being? Like a good sense of yeah. how their potential changes in test scores. Yeah. Um, and I know you spent so much time with these different community groups. What's your impression of whether the school system really is better for kids now? Right. Uh, I think it's. It's better, but I think there's a, there are some big philosophical issues about what better means, right? So um, I think the schools are definitely more focused on basic academic skills than before, like, and that's what we've been able to measure, and I think that's what we're seeing in the scores. But you know, I, I think there is reason to be worried about the, the loss of, uh, of the arts. That's been one that I think clearly there was a loss in that, at least at the beginning. Uh, a lot of the charter schools are now starting to create bands and things that they didn't have at first, so they're, they're, they're sort of they're, they're converging back to what traditional, to some degree, back to what traditional schools look like. A lot of them have also cut their hours down. So initially they were having these really insane hours, and then they started to cut back again more toward the traditional uh, hours. So I think uh, they're better off academically in the sense of these basic academic skills that we're measuring. I think it's a lot harder to determine whether they're better off in a larger sense. First of all, we don't have any data on that. But I think you're probably asking me, well, just what's my impression? Um, I think they're going to be better off in the long term and the things we usually focus on in terms of their income and their job prospects and their college prospects. I think they'll be better off in those respects. Um, but they'll definitely be different people than they would have been under the old system in other ways because the system is just so different from what it was. It's trying to do things so differently. You, you mentioned that some students, or at least at one point, were pushed out of schools for low performance. Did you look at all where those students went from there? What, you know, how did you oh, we, account for them? Uh, we can't see who's being pushed out. That's okay. the main problem with that kind of an analysis. We do have a mobility study uh, that will be coming out relatively soon, actually, uh, that looks for general patterns in the data. So one of the, one of the results of that is that uh, high-performing students are migrate to high-performing schools, and low-performing students are less likely to migrate to high-performing schools. So that, that suggests some sort of uh, splitting apart of, of the system over time. Um, but all we can really look at is, we can look at mobility patterns, but we can't really say much about push-out, per se. I had a question about the heterogeneous effect. I had two, but I think you kind of alluded to the second one in the mobility questions. First is, Obviously, free and reduced lunch is a really broad measure. You know, in, in, in New Orleans, given how many students qualify for free and reduced lunch, that, that's the bulk of the students. And I don't, you have a data problem, but is there any way to f capture whether students at the lower end of free and reduced lunch are responding differently to the reform than others? Uh, we're trying to get data that at least distinguishes free from reduced. Yeah. Uh, we haven't been able to get that yet, but uh, that, that's as fine-grained as we could get. And do you have, and perhaps you answered this with your question about high achieving students, but do you have a sense that, for example, the white students are, I'm sure that the schools were highly segregated before Katrina, and, and are there differences in the, the composition? Yeah, so we have a study on segregation. Uh, so that suggests, as you, as you suggested, that segregation was very high to start with, and it didn't get any worse, and it didn't get any better. Uh, it depends on which which group you look at. Um, by race, it actually, I think, got better. Uh, by, we also did it by achievement level, so see whether low-scoring low students were being more concentrated. It does look like there was, there's more segregation by achievement level than there was before. Um, I was thinking about how this is obviously focusing on what the what was going on in the school systems school system and wondering if there are any any other programs that were going on like that were uh, was there some influx of money or programming and public housing or anything any other other external factors that might have you mean be before or after after Katrina um. Well, there, there was the changes in public housing that I mentioned, that they, they demolished all the public housing and they replaced it with the, the new lower density stuff, which other cities had done a long time ago. The New Orleans housing projects were like 70 years old. So that was the main change in housing. 
there were some new healthcare initiatives. Actually, Tim was pretty involved in some of the new healthcare initiatives. Um, nothing that I can see, and again, nobody has suggested that those things are likely key drivers in this. Uh, I, think, I think part of it is this, this, we keep coming back to the idea that the trauma effects were so bad that whatever good things we might have tried to do to offset them, that it probably didn't work, <laughs> right? That we probably couldn't offset those negative effects. So the, you spoke about the Education Research Alliance being kind of an objective creator of evidence um, in a place where that's really needed. I was, you know, I'm, I'm a Twitter participant, and so <laughs> at, at the 10th anniversary, there was just kind of this right. explosion right. Um, of articles about New Orleans, and on this question that Anissa asked, are students better? People seemed to kind of want to make an unqualified yes, or no, and so I was just kind of wondering how you guys thought about your role, like in that discussion. Um, we, well, we try to be humble, right? That we, we're trying to inform the debate. We're not trying to change the debate. Uh, we're not trying to uh, move in any particular policy direction. And so, we, so part of it is being careful <coughs> about what we write and be, be careful, being careful about what we say about what happened, and making sure we. State the caveats, and we that we talk about the the big picture the whole time. Um, at the same time, I think it, what's happened in the first year was been really interesting because the first paper we put out was sort of neutral issue. It was about how parents choose schools, so there wasn't a big splashy headline in that one. The second one we put out was how do principals respond to competition, which suggested they respond in some pretty awful ways. Uh, the, the cream skimming was one. The the the, the headline quote was um, one principal said, uh, "Every kid is money." Uh, and that was, right, so that sort of encapsulated this, uh, this competitive business model, cold-hearted kind of perspective on what was going on. The reformers hated us at that point because, you know, they didn't even deny that it was happening. They said, well, that was, that was happening before, right? It's all changed. We're all better now. Um, you know, and, I, and so part of it was having to push back and say, no, look, you, you can't do that, right? You can't say, you, know, you can't, say, you can't criticize us for saying something that you know is true uh, because it happened two years ago. So a lot of it is, you know, uh, conversations behind the scenes and that sort of uh, not uh, trying to get them to, to calm down and just realize that there are some bad things happening and we need to say them and we also need to say the good things that are happening. Uh, and so then the flip, then, then what happened is it totally flipped. So then we released the, the, the good news uh, about the achievement effects uh, and it totally then the reformers were like, oh, patting me on the back, saying, wow, great study. And, and the people who didn't like the reforms were vilifying us. And it was, yeah. So, um, it, you know, it is what it is. We, we need to be able to take that criticism. I need to, first of all, I have to buffer everybody else in the organization from it, right? So I take it <coughs> and try to keep everybody shielded from it so that everybody else can just focus on the work and not have to be worried about what the pushback's going to be. I'll worry about the pushback. Uh, they just need to do the work. So I, that's how I think. That, that's my biggest concern, is making sure that we don't pull punches because we're worried about what somebody's going to say. And I don't, think we, I don't think we have. I'll, I'll go ahead first. I've got my mic. OK. <laughs> um, I was curious about whether um, in these intermediate outcomes that you all are looking at in the future, you're including any um, affective outcomes for educators in the district um, some of what Jim was asking about in terms of repli replicability made me think that maybe all of these reforms and this influx of money and new people really represents just kind of a general fire that had been lit at all levels of the district and um, changing motivation levels and behavior at kind of all levels and that, um, you know, those mechanisms are each just sort of a representation of this more general change. Okay, so let me... Let me let me rephrase and see if I have it right. So the idea is that it wasn't that any, I'm thinking about this too micro, that, that there was a change in the teachers and there was a change in charter schools and all these little changes. And it wasn't really that per se, it was sort of a general feeling of motivation, a general feeling of wanting to help the district and wanting the city to rebuild and that that was really what was driving it. Uh, it's possible. Um, it's hard, obviously very hard to test that. Um, 
I'm just curious yeah, to yeah. see if any of those types of outcomes are being considered, because yeah. as you mentioned, there were these drastic changes, yeah. which are now kind of, you know, the uh, drastic change in hours, which are dying back down, at probably as people settle down a little bit. Um, right. So the other thing we've done, and we haven't utilized these data enough yet, so we did a survey last year where we tried to interview every teacher and leader in the city. And we had, a, we had this nice skip pattern at the beginning. We were asked them, were you a pre-Katrina teacher? And if, if they were a pre-Katrina teacher, we sent them to a totally different survey, basically, and had them answer all sorts of questions comparing their experiences before and after the reforms. We haven't, unfortunately, analyzed those data yet. I think that's probably as close as we're ever going to get. We also, we, I think we may have asked some other questions that we're getting uh, more at that, but I'm not sure probably enough to, to, to really answer your question very well. Part of the challenge is getting people to respond to surveys is tough, uh, especially in New Orleans where thing, the whole idea is to make this decentralized and to not tell anybody. So, so I can't go to the district. I have to go to every single school separately to recruit them to be in a survey. And we managed to get about 52 out of 85 at the time to participate at some level. Uh, but it, it's, uh, bare, it's a lot more work to do it in New Orleans than it is anywhere else. Uh, but it's a good question. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure how I would test it necessarily, but I, I'll think about what new survey questions. Are there members of your research team that are um, conducting some interviews of families and children in the district just to try and get at the why? So what's better? Why do you think the change has occurred? Or Right, no, that's a good question. So we haven't done much of that. There are other researchers that were doing that kind of work. So partly we decided to, to specialize partly because that of work that I usually do, it, it made sense to do that, and I'm in the economics department. Um, but we also knew that there were other researchers doing more of that sort of thing. I, I haven't seen a lot of it come out yet. Um, Haria Jabbar is on our research team. She's a qualitative researcher at UT Austin, uh, and she's done a lot of interviewing, mostly though of teachers and school leaders, not so much parents and families. So um, I'll have to look and see whether there's a, an ongoing project specifically on students and their families. That's a good question. The question Vivian asked earlier about the um, characteristics of charters made me wonder if maybe the like process or rigor of charter approval has changed before and after, and if that's something that could be sort of leveraged. Uh, no, that's an interesting uh, mechanism we haven't talked about much. So there, was, there were four charter schools in New Orleans before, so there was not a lot of action kind of in a before and after sense, but it did evolve over time. So. After Katrina, they did a contract with the National Association of Public Charter School Authorizers uh, in DC to be the ones to review applications and to make recommendations. And those recommendations, I think with one exception, were followed completely by the state board that had ultimate decision making. Uh, then it changed, so about two or three years ago, they switched and they did, just decided to do it themselves. Um, I don't know whether the decisions are ultimately changing uh, as a result of that. Um, my sense is that they wanted to have more control, that they couldn't follow, easily follow the recommendations of an outside agency when part of the mission, they view it as creating a, the right mix of schools. So no outside agency could really make that kind of a determination. They're looking at each individual application, whereas the school system wants to look at the whole. At the whole. So I think it probably made sense for them to take it back over again. Um, that's at the initial authorization stage. At the closure stage, it's a little bit more mechanical because you can only get certain kinds of renewal uh, under certain circumstances that are based on their test scores and the school letter grades. There's some wiggle room uh, in there based on other factors and more subjective factors, but they, they sort of tie their own hands a bit and, and really focus on the scores. <clears throat> so thanks very much. Thank you.